Welcome back to So Very Wrong About Games. My name is Michael Walker, and I'm here with Mark Bigney. How are you today, Mark? I'm very well, Michael. How are you doing? Always good. So, people like to call things that they're scared of and are big and nasty a myth, like climate change. So I've decided that my Kickstarter addiction is a myth. So there you go. Anyway, once again, we're here to talk about games. So first, we're going to talk about games we played this week, news and why it doesn't matter, our feature game will be Alien Artifact, and our topic of today is what does Kickstarter bring to the table? First of all, Mark, what did you play this week? So I'm going to talk first about a game that I've got a lot of history with, and that's Secret Hitler. Back in my past life, when we were on YouTube, I did a video review of Secret Hitler. It was, in fact, the second one I ever did. And actually, I'm considering going back to it as sort of a, a retrospective, maybe doing a, a follow-up review, uh, perhaps on YouTube. If anyone's interested in that, just give me a holler and I'll, I'll, I'll give it a consider. But anyway, this is the social deduction game by uh, Boxlighter, Moranges, and Temkin. It's uh, some of the same people who did Cards Against Humanity, and it's kind of a, a, a spiritual successor to the Resistance. And at the time when I first reviewed it, I commented that it was an interesting variant on the Resistance. I prefer the I prefer the Resistance, but it's still very good. My opinion has has gone steadily south on Secret Hitler as time goes on. The randomness, which I initially thought merely confused the information state of the game, is actually undermining the game state considerably. Uh, to make a very long story short, it's just when you have your opportunity to make a move, sometimes the random deck tells you you can't make your move. And as a result, it can feel, as to invent, to uh, borrow a, a walker term, it can feel very handcuffing at times. And so not only does that confuse people, but it means you, you can't get to play because uh, things are random. There are a couple of other minor details. That All that having been said, I still enjoy the game. I love almost all social deduction games if there's any possibility for any actual deduction. And in Secret Hitler, you still can make inferences, albeit confused one. So I had a good time, but uh, the, more, the more and more I play it, the more I, I solidly wish that the local people enjoyed the resistance as much as they ought to. But uh, not everyone can be as, uh, as cursed as we are, and we're cursed with good taste. I'll segue into my party game, which is Sheriff Nottingham. But on just a quick generalization, that's what's making me sort of shy away from these party games is this meta game. I was told that there's like a meta game in Sheriff of Nottingham where you can like parse out, you know, how many cards and it turns into like an unfun experience when you're playing with people who have played it often. And same mm. thing with Avalon where people are go into the super meta of the game. Well, he said this time and two turns ago he did this. When I really don't think it might, people could argue that this is why the game was designed to be like this, but I'm wondering if this is just supposed to be taken on the surface, these games. It's supposed to be just a fun, quick social deduction game that you play and have fun playing, and then it is over. And I'm, I'm wondering if this deep dive into these games is, is what, why we see why these games break down when this happens, because it's just not supposed to be played that way. I agree. It can often be unfortunate. I would. Uh, it's one of the reasons why I find people who play Hanabi, the co-op game uh, where you're not allowed to talk to each other, uh, I, I find so often they're cheating because they have these well-established group conventions. It's like, well, they played this tile, which necessarily communicates to the group because we all know that this is what it means, all, all the following things, and so I know my next five moves or, or what have you. I do agree that it's unfortunate when they start bringing in previous games or, oh, the way our group does it is if you don't do this, you must be untrustworthy. And yeah, very often that happens. I find, for what it's worth, I'll just, again, put in a plug for the resistance that I, I find that that doesn't happen from game to game as much. It happens within a game, absolutely. If it's the case that you establish certain parameters within a single session, that can definitely give you some information to tease out people as being untrustworthy. But yes, once par people start talking about that time they played last week, or this is just how the way everything happens, I find many, many, many games break down, but social deduction games especially. So back to Sheriff Nottingham. Thought it was a great game in the atmosphere because we played it in a bar. If someone brought this out on a gaming night, I would have to slap them dead in the face. But other than that, I thought Sheriff Nottingham was great. I was looking forward to playing it. I had not played it yet. It was the first time I played it. It's a great game where you're like trying to sneak goods through. You're you know, handing secret packages to you know the sheriff goes around the table. Everyone takes a turn and you you know you're passing in packages, lying about what it is. I thought it was a great party game. Threatening physical assault. That's a bold move. Oh, I'm, I'm going to take it to the next level here. Okay, no longer messing around. 
I additionally played Keyflower last week. This is a Sebastian Bleasdale and Richard Brees game from 2012. It has a uh, well-deserved reputation as being an excellent Euro game. It does this fascinating thing where it combines worker placement and auctions, and it interleaves them through with the same resources and happening at the same time where you're simultaneously bidding on and activating tiles. Uh, It's a very, very physically lovely game. It's very smooth playing. Despite that, it's very, very hard to explain. I've had a number of shots at explaining the rules at uh, Keyflower, and every time I think I do a hash of it, I think part of it is just that the setup is such a a bear, and so I'm trying to figure out the setup at the same time as I'm explaining this thing. And in its core, it's reasonably straightforward, but new players always seem intimidated. Uh, So I guess that's on me. And it is very much... You know, full disclosure, it is very much the sort of soulless Euro. It's a very procedurally driven thing where it's about resource efficiency and eking out points through upgrades and stuff. And it doesn't really have any thematic core, which makes some of the game mechanisms perhaps even more unfortunate. There's this overriding thing about the game where meeples of different colors refuse to work together. And it's quite striking that there's no mention in the rulebook about why this is or what this meant to represent. So I always say that this is a game about racism, about immigrant groups arriving in a new land and then steadfastly refusing to live or work together. Uh, but well, I, I don't know. What, what other explanation no, could there that's be? That's great. Do you have a better explanation? I you're, do you're, not. Nope, not touching that. From the man who gave us alien abductions into the Great Western Trail, you've got nothing for me to save me from my explanation of racism? <laughs> no, I think that's fantastic, actually. Okay, fair no, enough. So, I, I didn't want to add it. I, okay, so Walker now I'm endor- all in. Walker I'm all endorses in. two things now. Physical violence for suggesting a game and... Uh, integrated racism. Integrating racism into our board games. This is Perfect. fascinating. Anyway, I love Key Flower. Well, actually, that's, that's a bit too strong. I really like Keyflower. I don't quite love it because it feels a little soulless and because of how difficult it is to get to the table because of all the, the, the setup nonsense. But it's, it's, it's a game that I love in my collection and I'm going to keep around. No, I agree. I think it's a classic. I really enjoy it. I'm thinking some of the problems are I think it has game mechanics that are not used in other games. Like the, the being able to use other people's tiles in a Euro, usually you only have your own. If you're, if you're developing a tableau, usually it's your tableau. Not so much in Keyflower. The fact that you're bidding on, like the whole bidding mechanism, where it can only be one color, that is totally unique to Keyflower as well. Because I, I think it's just so many different mechanisms in one game is what's making it hard to... Uh, to teach and it once again falls under the same problem as whoever's played before is going to have a an advantage I think. absolutely i'm going to talk about niroshima hex i don't think we've talked about it yet fantastic i feel two-player game it's one of these other things where they say you can play with more people but it's not it's a two-player game uh where you're playing tiles it's very chess like i feel back and forth forcing people like as in your uh you're forcing your opponent to make moves you're pressuring them into doing things like chess. I'm going to talk specifically about the new faction I got to try. It's called Death Breath. I think they're up to 16 different armies you can play in that was in, Hex. That was inspired by your halitosis, correct? Correct. Totally. You'll see it in the, if you look at the back of the book under publisher notes, it's in there. And it also says in our show notes that I will leave no obvious joke unsaid. I'm glad I pitched you the softball. Back to Death Breath. It's like an undead faction. It's pretty It's pretty interesting. Instead of uh, usually when your units die, you take them off the board. In Death Breath case, you're going to put them to the side. It's now your graveyard. When you kill enemy units, you're going to put tokens down. At the end of combat, you're going to replace uh, your opponent's dead units with units from your graveyard. There's all sorts of other different mechanisms, but oh, when they, there's uh, green attacks on your units as well. So when you put them out, they don't get those attacks, but when you bring them from the graveyard oh. uh, onto the board, you put yet another secondary token on them to show that they have been brought back to life and now they get these special green attacks, whatever they may be. Uh, there's, I don't feel that there's any creep with any of these new armies. I think they've got a great do- job of balancing. The last we've heard about Neoshima Hex is that they've dedicated they're going to put a new army out every year. So that's great. They've already announced what the next one's going to be, so we'll see how that goes. Just a small question. Did you play as the Death Breath or against the Death Breath? As the, as the Death Breath. It looked great for me at the beginning, but ultimately got destroyed. It just sounds like it would be a hard faction to play against, almost like uh, Shogi, right? Because well, any eliminated piece can come back. Well, that's what we thought at first as well, but they have a lot of units because they're slow, they're undead, they go very slow, and they have a lot of attacks in their 
in their chipset, so it looks as though like their strategy is to put a unit out and attack immediately with it in order to kill or to get another unit out in order to keep going. And if that cycle's broken, i.e. I had a, a draw where I drew five attack tiles in a row, mm. I think that's what uh, broke the chain. So it's, it seems though it's an army that can quickly fall apart, but still interesting to play. Nourishium Hex is definitely, you're absolutely right, it's very chess-like. And it looks like an Ameritrash battle game, but it's not. It's more or less an abstract with a pasted-on post-apocalyptic theme. And it's very good for what it is. I'm usually not in the market for such abstracts. But uh, honestly, if, if if that sounds remotely appealing to you, a sort of abstract with, with the veneer of a, of a fight going on, and you're interested in a two-player-only game, you have to check it out. It, it's, a, it's a very good product. I, th- I definitely think it's Portal's flagship, and they've done a wonderful job developing it, and I agree with you. There's been no power creep, despite the fact that there's now over a dozen factions. So, by all means, check it out. We also pulled out Empires of the Void 2. This is a new game that I got just a couple days ago from Kickstarter. This is by Ryan Laucat at Red Raven. Ryan Laucat's an interesting guy. He designs, publishes, and illustrates all his games. Uh, Not by himself, of course. He's got a a good support team. I like his art style. I like his world building. His designs, I've not always been as cool on. His Probably his biggest breakout hit was Above and Below. And I had serious problems with that. I thought it was a a relatively relatively arbitrary, too light worker placement affair with some tacked on adventure paragraphs type stuff. But his first published design, Empires of the Void, once you add in the free print-and-play expansion called Key to the Universe, I think is a really solid game. I think it's a really, really good sort of light-ish 4X, not as heavy as Eclipse, certainly not as heavy as Twilight Imperium. You get to run around and make huge fleets of ships and kill things. It's got an interesting sort of distinction between controlling a planet because you've subjugated them and allying with a planet, which is more difficult and... Uh, ultimately more rewarding because they give you access to unique racial texts and all that kind of thing. And that distinction and some of the alien races are pretty much all that's left from the first Empires of the Void in Empires of the Void 2. I'm surprised he called it Empires of the Void 2 because it, it leads to a certain degree of confusion. There's the expectation that it's going to be, you know, the second edition or the same game done over again. And other than the fact that it is a space game featuring these alien races he's made, they're entirely different. So I, I, I'm, I, I've read a number of his designer diaries. I'm not 100% sure why he did it that way, and I, I'd like to ask him sometime. But at any rate, only one play, so more to say later. I was reasonably disappointed. Uh, I, didn't, uh, I didn't like it nearly as much as the first one. I wanted things to have a little more character than they did. He talked a lot about wanting the planets to have their own personality and having the alien races to have their own character and, and, and a little bit more than just window dressing. I should disclose that one of the, the the reason why I bought the game is because he says it was in part inspired by Star Control 2, which is the greatest video game ever made. And I, while reading the rules, while setting up the game, while playing the game, I kept telling myself, don't judge it by Star Control 2, don't judge it by Star Control 2, because if you, of course, hold it up to the thing that you think is the greatest ever, you're naturally going to think it's not as good. That having been said, I found it reasonably disappointing, a reasonably pedestrian kind of affair. There's role selection going on, but the way role selection is meant to work is if you select the role, you get some kind of bonus, and then everyone who follows you does the same thing, but not as well. Otherwise, it just feels kind of samey, and everyone's going around doing the same thing. And the role selection in Empires of the Void 2, no, you don't get a bonus for choosing the action, with one exception. And so that's the action that is the most interesting Anyhow, I'm going to be playing it again. I'm definitely not... This is not going to be a one and done just because I want to see if there's more to it or if I was approaching it with the wrong mindset. I'm going to try to pay more attention to the different races and the different worlds and try to see if it does inject some degree of narrative or arc in terms of the experience that other games uh, don't don't give us. But that was my impression of the game. Yeah, I enjoyed it. The art was fantastic. I think they tried to make the you know races different they had two stats to work with right how many dice they were going to roll and how much power they added and that's you know how they were making the diff- the races different you know there's some flavor text there i i didn't like i said i always say i use this phrase a lot i just didn't see the hook i didn't see it bring anything new to the table you know you're picking actions and you're and you're getting victory points i'm really like you said i want to play it more the moving around the map seemed very arbitrary that you could almost get anywhere you wanted. There was other all, also more text that you could get that would just let you teleport where you wanted to go. But I want to play it more, for sure. 
Yeah, the way the the races are supposed to be differentiated, the way the planets are supposed to have a kind of a theme is through the events and through the action cards. And I got a tiny bit of that, and I was wondering if I just wasn't paying enough attention or if it was just a, you know, just focusing on the mechanics too much. But one hopes that with a maybe again, maybe a different group, maybe a different mindset, maybe just with with repeat exposure, you're just going to get a little bit more of that flavor coming into things, get a greater sense of the universe. Because it's even the case that the different planets have relationships with each other. You know, one planet is supposed to be at war with another planet, or there's supposed to be some sort of ongoing rebellion. And some of the action cards made reference to that, and some of the missions made reference to that. I'm going to talk about another game we both played, and that's going to be Unlock 2 House on the Hill. It is one of these escape room card games. This is one that you can actually reset and give to someone else. You can't play it yourself again, but you can give it to somebody else. I think it's the first time that both of us have played an escape room game. I really enjoyed it. We did great. I think I think we you know broke the game we did so well. I, I don't even think it could register the quickness of time in which we completed this particular game. Yeah, it, it gave us uh, one star out of five, but I think that's only because the little graphic couldn't accommodate the 12 stars that we clearly deserved. Yeah, I think it sort of like wrapped around yeah. the infinite symbol and came back to the one, right? It was like an error in the in the app. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree entirely. Uh, first of all, I think you're mispronouncing the title of the game. It's not Unlock, it's Unlock! So I, I, I hate I'm it sure when there's... I missed, I, I you, didn't type in the exclamation point. I, I apologize. You, ha- you have to get the punctuation. Without the punctuation, it's wrong. I will say about Unlock that... I liked it far more than I thought I would. I've said before, and I'll say it again, I don't like puzzles. I just don't enjoy them. The notion of playing an actual escape room fills me with a sense that could best be described as dread. It just strikes me as the least enjoyable way that anyone could decide to pass their... Well, that I could decide to pass my time. So I've been invited to escape rooms a couple times that I've always refused because, I number one, I wouldn't be helpful. I'm bad at them. And number two, I find them, I find them stressful and unpleasant. But I did like how it... For me, a lot of the interest was just in how it was executing it with the cards. And it reminded me a little bit of Time Stories. Just the way that it tries to communicate puzzles with just a deck of cards and an app, I thought was reasonably clever. It it, it did a, it was a low component overhead execution of some logic puzzles. It was, and it was less about logic puzzles, more about sort of the adventure game logic, you know, the point and click adventure games that maybe many of our viewers were born after they stopped making. But uh, the the other person we played with, he would pull out these bizarre connections that made no sense to me, and he would just shrug and say, eh, adventure games. And, you know, half the time they, they worked. So it was a very successful implementation of a kind of thing that I don't care about, and I was surprised that I found it reasonably enjoyable. Yeah, the only block I see is that uh, they have this mechanism that's called hidden objects. And if you have any sort of eyesight problem or you're getting you know longer in the tooth i think that this is a a part of the game that you're just not going to be able to see so i'm wondering if that's going to be a stumbling block because i i i have i originally wanted to get it to use in that sort of you know older group with grandparents you know older uncles and aunts but there was i'm glad that it never happened because there's no way that they would be able to see these clues that having been said Number one, I'm glad that that was in the game because that was my key contribution to the group. I was able to point out that there was a, an obscured number somewhere and uh, be able to tell us uh, tell people that it was that because if there was any actual thinking involved, I was entirely useless. And number two, there was a sort of visual acuity puzzle where you looked at a card at a certain angle and read a message, and I still I looked at that thing for <laughs> a solid minute and I could not see what you were seeing. So. Maybe it's the case that different kinds of skills can be brought to bear in the same yeah, group. So. That's, yeah, that's the really neat part, too. Like, we all we all contributed something, right, that no one else could. So I thought that was a really neat part of the game as well. Fair enough. That's an excellent point that I hadn't fully appreciated. All right. I have just one last quick thing for this week, and that was we played TI4 yet again. And I'm only mentioning because we've actually, you know, it's a... It's now a monthly thing we've started. It's a, it's our our monthly TI4 group, and I think that's great because I think I've played it, like I said, this new game, I think I've played it more than the third edition, and it's definitely getting to the table and getting my money's worth off a game that I enjoy. And by TI, you mean? Twilight Imperium 4. We're trying to be a little bit clearer here about So Very Wrong About Games. Launching it, instead of launching into the minutiae of a game before explaining the basic premise, you know, we'll try to give a little bit more of a smoother intro 
uh, a friend of mine unfairly, uh, well, unflatteringly, he meant it as a, as a pejorative, said that our description of games were haiku-like. Uh, and I don't think he meant beautiful and elegant and refined. I think he instead <laughs> meant too damn short. Yeah, segmented and painful. <laughs> Precisely. Uh, so I'm glad I'm glad you're enjoying Twilight Imperium 4, and I'm glad that you have found uh, fellow idiots who uh, are similarly cursed with your uh, bizarre fixation on the thing. The last game that I have to talk about is also quick, but it's also because it's a quick game, is Cockroach Poker. This is a game that uh, you and I have been very enthusiastic about. We didn't, we didn't play it this time, though. I played it with uh, some other people who are also very enthusiastic about it. This is a... a it, party-ish bluffing game for up to six people by uh, Jacques Zemet, where it's more or less pure bluffing. You hand someone a card, you make an assertion about the card, they either believe you or don't, and whoever is wrong gets to keep it, and keeping cards is bad. Uh, first of all, one of the things that, that's rather clever about it and really emphasizes the extent to which this is a game about pain and lying is there's only one loser. Everyone else wins. And <laughs> it lends itself to bullying, which is a strange way to praise a game, but it, it feels really good. Every once in a while, you get to get together, have some in-group, out-group psychology, and decide that what you really want to do is saddle some friend of yours with four stink bugs and then point out how they lost and the five of you won. It's really fun. It's extremely simple. It's got cute art. You can explain it in a couple of seconds. It's uh, it's mean. It's funny. It's it's a great game. If you like bluffing, try Cockroach Poker. For sure. And like, like you said, I love it. You love it. And like I said, it's one of these games that would break down if you try to analyze it too much. Just play it and have fun. Absolutely. So is that it for what we played last week, Walker? It is. And I meant to I have an errata that I didn't play at the beginning, so I want to I'll insert it now. Last week you talked about Black Hole Council. I made an offhanded remark about uh, being blue and purple and had a Lion Man on the cover. That is because I mixed it up with a game that was called Immortal 8. So I just want to get that. Oh, I thought... No, no, okay. it totally was not. You, I thought you this took was... it as that, you know, you thought it was a vagrant, just, you know, slight, but it was not. There was I a... thought... No, no, no. I thought it was specifically a crack about Twilight Imperium. I thought it was just... Wow. It, it, was, it was an offhanded crack about Twilight Imperium, but it was supposed to be an actual, you know, meaningful, because I thought you were talking about Immortal 8, and it would have made sense if you were talking about Immortal 8. But anyway. Sure, sure. I, I digress. There is... It was, it was in the same feed... So it was like a story right underneath. That's why I, just, I just got the image mixed up with the the uh, black hole. See, here, here's the thing, Walker. You're playing three dimensional chess while I'm still playing checkers. You've got, you know, your references are so deep and so dense <laughs> that you have to sit and think about it. I, I mean, this is this is this is wonderful. All right, on to news and why it doesn't matter. What have you got first? Well, since you mentioned Immortal Eight, I did happen to notice it. Immortal Eight is a drafting game. And I'm always looking for a drafting game that I'm going to like as much as Fairy Tale. Fairy Tale is just a pure drafting game, more or less. There's nothing else to it. And every drafting game I've played since then, like Seven Wonders, for example, I've asked myself the question, why shouldn't I just play Fairy Tale instead? Um, so I don't know. I'll probably try Immortal Eight when it comes out, but I only mention that because you brought it up. True. If you know anyone that has a copy of Fairy Tale, please get them to teach it to you and show you the greatness that is Fairy Tale. Another point of uh, news that I have, and this is great. This is great news, and I'm sincerely happy about this. And that is that I think we can declare that Chinese New Year has been mainstreamed in the board gaming community. I love Chinese New Year. Chinese New Year. Here's the thing. I don't kickstart nearly as many games as I used to, but every year around November or so, you start to get these emails from Kickstarter updates that make references to Chinese New Year, and they always start out optimistic, and they gradually get more and more pessimistic as time goes on, and then sure enough, you get that email sometime around this season, early January, it's like, look guys, we're sorry. We're not going to be Chinese New Year. We're not going to make fulfillment in January. Instead, you're going to get fulfillment in April. And... The thing that I can announce now is the emails that I've gotten this year about Chinese New Year didn't then have to explain what Chinese New Year is. It's mainstream now. They assume you know. So all these product and uh, uh, updates telling us that they either are or are not going to beat Chinese New Year then didn't explain, well, look, you have to understand that two, for two weeks of the year, China shuts down for New Year. So it's now a thing. Everyone knows about it now. I don't have to get the same cultural explanation half a dozen times in my email inbox every every damn year. 
So I think that's that's a big development. I think it's great. I think there's only two sayings in our gaming group, and that it's just like Splendor and Chinese New Year. Yeah, for a while, Walker would blame any lateness of his on Chinese New Year. He'd show up an hour late, and he's like, yeah, sorry, Chinese New Year. It was great and terrible. My news, Clash of Cultures. It's a great board game. I'm not sure if you've tried it yet, but maybe once. I really like it, and other people I know enjoy it. Unfortunately, it is not going to get the reprint everyone wanted. So the expansion and Clash of Cultures is on hold for now. So that is ungood. Yeah, what, what, what is the deal with Z-Man? I don't know if Clash of Culture. Now, maybe it was a, a rational, conscious decision. Maybe they didn't sell the previous print runs fast enough or whatever. Uh, but ever since, ever since Z-Man left Z-Man, I, I confess I don't quite understand what a lot of their moves are. Uh, you know, WizKids seems to be going up. Z-Man seems to be going down. It's, it's Maybe weird. the new Civ game came out, so they... I'm not sure if that had anything to do with it, or maybe they just thought the market was enough, or who knows? Possibly. I do know that the designer of Clash of Cultures is going to be looking for another publisher, and we'll see if there's enough interest and demand for that. Of course, immediately whenever someone shows up and says, hey, you know, the rights have reverted to me, I'm going to look for another publisher, you get half a dozen people saying, go to Kickstarter, I'll give you money, but, you know, it's hard to tell. Oh, it'll be another cycle, right, where everyone's going to try to offload their Clash of Cultures now at crazy absorbing prices, and people will hang on to them, and then they'll announce the reprint, and those people will miss out on selling their copy, and once again, I'll just hang on to mine because it's a fantastic game. Well, with that in mind... We should now move on into our feature game, which is going to be Alien Artifacts. This was put up by Portal, uh, well, last year now, in twenty late 2017. And uh, this is by a couple of fine individuals whose names I'm not even going to try to pronounce because I'm an ignorant white guy. So what happens essentially in Alien Artifact is you, you're going to take a deck of 83 resource cards, cycle through it a number of times, depending on how many players are playing. You're going to root, use the resources on these cards to carry out a series of actions whether they be to build ships develop technologies or discover planets and doing these three things is going to give you new actions or modify the actions that you already have to help you get more points and make your actions more efficient and when you're done cycling through the ad- the deck an adequate number of times the game is over and whoever has the most points wins do you yeah. think that's an accurate portrayal of this game yeah it's a card driven uh tableau builder like many other card driven tableau builders if you've ever played race of the galaxy if you played a 51st state master set even if you've played games like through the ages or ginkopolis any game where you're using building up a set of cards in front of you that are used to power up your actions going forward that's more or less the wheelhouse that i would put alien artifacts in so let's start it off uh I just went right from the beginning of the game where you're handing out the factions and there's no real difference in the factions. I thought, you know, you have this space game where you have a entire universe to work with. You have, I really enjoyed the art. The art was great. Made the, the, all the different factions look very interesting, but there was, it's like, Oh, you get, you know, different, there's three different cards and all it changed was you get one of this instead of two and you get this on the right hand side of your tableau instead of the left. That was the complete, that was all that was different in the different factions. I thought that was a ball massively dropped on their part. Well, I think it's it, it's part and parcel of the straightforward simplicity of the game. I don't know that the game engine could tolerate or would want to tolerate any sort of massive asymmetry in the different factions. I'll agree with you about the artwork, and I'll agree with you that there's not much faction differentiation. I don't necessarily know if that was a missed opportunity on their part, but it is it is a salient feature of it. I will say, though, that the factions don't give me a sense of homogeneity, but the different turns definitely do. This is a game where pretty much everything costs you five. Five dollars, five resources, then some minor modifications. You know, the second ship, the first ship you build costs you five ship symbols. The second ship you build costs you six, and then the third seven, and so forth. And yeah, there are a couple things you can do to offset that, but mostly you're, you're getting to five, plus or minus. And this has two salient difficulties to me. One of them is, again, just turns feel relatively samey. Everything either takes one or two turns to get done, more or less. Because the game has this artificial limit called the assembly limit. 
most of the time, almost overwhelmingly, all you can do is devote two of these resource cards. Now, you might be thinking, ah, well, but what about your resource card income? Well, your resource card income is non-existent because at the end of your turn, you always draw back to your hand of resource cards. Resource cards just spend them if you got them. There's no restriction on using them other than this incredibly artificial assembly limit. So you either spend the cards you've got, or if you the cards you have aren't enough, you sock them away for uh, a future turn by a, a, the, the one mechanic that allows forward planning, and then you draw back up to your hand of three anyway. The exception to this is when, is when you finally have your engine built, and you've got all your little point generation machines lined up in a row, and there are a couple of different ways you can do this, then it's time to pump that engine. Either because you've got a bunch of ships out and you want to go attack somebody. More on that later. You've got all your techs out that you want to go score. You've got your planets out that you want to go score. You then need to pay five symbols in order to activate this engine that you've built. Okay, so you say. You're allowed to pay two cards to do that. So, by necessity, one of those two cards has to have three symbols on it. That's just the way the game works. Every resource, cards, uh, resource card has one, two, or three symbols on it. In order to pump the engine, you need to pay a five of a certain color. So then the question is, do you have a three of that color? If yes, you can pump your engine. If not, well, chuck your hand and wait till next turn. Now, you can do something, do something else with those cards. But this is an engine builder where you build your engine, and then whether or not you can turn your engine on every turn is just a function of whether you've drawn the card you need. If you do, go ahead and do it. If not, well, then do something else. And... As a result, any time when I've played the game and I've got my engine in place and I've got the car- got all my cards in a row and I've paid to build my cards, and again, paying to build my cards was just, again, getting to five. Do I have a three? Well, that's great. That makes things easier. If not, well, I'll sock it away and I'll take two turns rather than one turn. And then I just wait to see if I get the threes. And honestly... <laughs> It was, it's, it's perfectly smooth and pleasant, but the more you scrutinize what you're actually doing and about how much is actually driven by these resource cards and these artificial limits called, like, like the assembly limit, it's just, you ask yourself why you're bothering with any of this stuff. Yeah, what am I getting out of this game? Yeah. And like you said, with the actions, you get one a turn and they're, you know, it's not an important action, but everyone gets one. And there's these technologies in the game that essentially will give one player two actions a turn. When you're twice as efficient, then... It seems broken. Yeah, some of the techs... I, I I hate to call something broken or overpowered, but a lot of the technologies seem very situational, and then some of the technologies are just a free gift all the damn time. Again, because you get these resource cards back every turn, you always just draw back up to three. Uh, one of them allows you to ditch a card for money every turn. Every turn. And since you're probably only going to be spending two cards, you'll have a third card to spare. So it's just free income all the damn time. And in a game where action efficiency is paramount, just being able to do extra stuff, or especially extra stuff that allows to power something else, is massive. And if you start out with a technology like that, it's it's just less... You have twice as much flexibility as everybody else. And when you compare that technology with, say, some other technology that just says, well, if A, B, and C are true, you get some marginal bonus, it's not nearly comparable. That's one of the things about the game. Everything you're doing is so smooth and simple and straightforward. It is indeed, a lot of turns are very pleasant, and a lot of the time that I've spent with the game just felt very smooth and neat. But when you take the single step back and you look at what you're doing and what's going on here... Basically, anything you accomplish is either going to take you one turn or two, more or less. Like, I, I don't think uh, a three-turn action, I think, is borderline impossible unless your your tableau is particularly bizarre. And so it's just about that marginal efficiency that you're going to get something out. And then when you've got your engine going, whether you randomly draw the card you need. So that's that's not really what I'm looking for in a game. All right, let's talk about the mess that is the blockade tokens. Yeah. Because I went on a bunch of forums uh this morning just to make sure we were up to date and once again portal you know doesn't chime in to clarify anything the wording is that if there's a blockade token on a card it is blank in normal games they will specify what exactly they mean by that it means that the text box is blank or disregard the text in this they do not say that so what are we to lead to believe we have to like in any other rule book, people like to read into the rules, but you really just need to take it at face value. When it says the card is blank, then the card is blank. And so when you pass out these blockade tokens and during gameplay and even end scoring, then you just can't use these cards unless you pay uh, the money in order to engage them. So it, it just seems very confusing and arbitrary. And it's it's important that you bring that up because 
This game is 100% multiplayer solitaire until you start considering blockade tokens. Blockade tokens are the primary consequence and most frequent result of attacks, which you can launch after building a certain number of ships and then going after and you get to arbitrarily, usually arbitrarily, pick an opponent around the table and say, I'm now going to scupper your engine. And these blockade tokens basically take the form either immediately or later on of skip a turn because you have two choices with respect to blockade tokens. You either spend a turn removing them Again, with these resource cards that you get for free. So removing, so you're not paying the cost in terms of cards. You're paying the cost in terms of time because you're spending your entire turn doing it. Or you pay money every time you want to activate a card that's blockaded. But it takes time to get the money back. So you either have the money and you're going to have to waste a turn later on to get the money just to pay for more blockade, uh, just to pay to bypass the blockades. Or you need to skip a turn first to get the money to bypass the blockades later. And uh, there are a couple things to stress on this. Number one, skipping a turn is never a good mechanic in games. Ever. Period. I, I don't think I've ever encountered a game where skipping a turn was like, oh yeah, that was the appropriate response to that solution. No. And given that this is the only player interaction of the game, there's no draft. There's no notion of passing cards around. There's not, there's not even a card display in the middle of the table. When you draw more than one card, you just fish deeper into the deck that nobody else got to saw, get to see. It's just mostly just drawing off the top of a deck, and there's no notion of taking a card that somebody else wanted to block it or denying it from somebody else. You're just looking at your own very, very simple card tableau. The second big problem with blockades is in a game with an engine builder, when you're only method of substantial player interaction is just to kick sand in somebody else's economic engine, that's not cool. It's not fun. It's not even particularly satisfying for the person handing out these blockade tokens. At its, What it usually amounts to is if player A thinks that player B is winning, player A might then be in the situation like, well, they're winning, so I guess I have to stop them. And that may or may not be true, but what people often forget and what is often so frustrating about games like that, if that dynamic is in place, it's not A or B that profits. It's everyone else at the table. Because the people not involved in the fight, who didn't waste their turn just to kick sand in the engine of player A, are the ones who didn't have to worry about any of this nonsense. And they just get to get go keep churning their engine. I thought of a scenario that could come in was when the game ends, when that resource deck depletes for the final time... They sort of one of their things of the game is that there's all sorts of different ways to victory, right? There's different paths you can take. And one of the paths is having a bunch of scoring cards that you're going to score at the end of the game. Say I've taken this strategy and I'm one of the first players. So I've taken my last turn. I just don't happen to have any blockade tokens because no one's attacked me with this game. Now there's three more people to go. They've decided, oh, I'm going to attack you now. I'm going to blockade these scoring cards that you've taken the whole game to put out and have, you know, taken all your actions in order to, you know, make these scoring cards work. Now the whole game was pointless for you. So the only thing I think is, well, when it's your last turn, you can do nothing else but make sure you have enough money so you can pay the, in case somebody blockades you. Ridiculous. Yeah, it's... I don't know what I don't know anything about the development process of this game or the design process of this game, but it almost feels like they had this tableau builder. And they're like, okay, this is a reasonably clean engine. Where do we get any player interaction here? And so they just grafted on this weird element of of really friction. It's just it's just friction for the sake of friction that doesn't really benefit any given player. There's now you can attack the middle of the table. There's uh, an alien world from which the eponymous alien artifacts come. And if you do a really, really successful attack against the alien planet, then you get some points and some goodies. And that's fine. I've got no problem with that. But that's just more elements of multiplayer solitaire. That's just more of I'm building my engine. Did I pull the three card that I need? Okay, let's go and attack. And did I then pull a lucky card to go get an alien artifact? Okay, let's pull a random card from this random deck, which may or may not be awesome or nonsense. Uh, So, you know, all of this is at its best... At its very best, it is perfectly inoffensive. At its worst, it's grotesquely offensive. It's just... Like, I want to go back to, like, the different races. Like, they have a hard cardboard card for a defense plan for everyone. Like, you have all these unique races that are completely different, yet, for whatever reason, all their ships defend exactly the same. And it's just card text. Like, you couldn't put in six other cards and make the defense plan slightly different for everyone? It just... And they already have expansions announced for this. Really? Really. So does this mean that they're going to 
grow this game over time? Are we supposed to just, you know, swallow this first one and wait for, you know, these expansions that are going to make the factions more unique? Or I, I didn't even look into them. I'm not even going to bother looking into them. Well, it, it's worth talking about these defense plans because I find that when after we played for the very first time and we, we looked at how the attacking worked, and we said, well, that's bizarre. If someone decides to predate on you, all they're going to do is make sure that your your engine stinks. And then we thought, okay, well, then maybe the defense against that is indeed build, get these things called defense plans. But the perverse element is, and this makes no sense to me, if you have a defense plan, if you're sitting on a defense plan, sometimes what that means is somebody attacking you will have their ships be damaged or destroyed. Sure. But here's a big difference between the defense plan that you worked to get and the sort of generic, I don't have a defense plan, come attack me. If you attack me and I don't have a defense plan, your best result, your strongest attack result, is that I, the victim, loses a point. Right? That doesn't really directly benefit you, the attacker, at all. The perverse element about getting a defense plan, and we looked through them, is the best result changes from the the loser losing a point to the attacker getting a point. Think about that for a second. What that means is if you've got a strong attack fleet, you have an interest in going and attacking the person who's bothered to build up their defenses. And that is completely ass backwards to me. If you're just going to be sitting around building up your engine and you don't really, you don't want to participate in the attack game. And if that is your vision of the world, I agree with you. That's probably the the more fun way to play the game. Then a purely self-interested aggressor will probably leave you alone. If there's another person with a defense plan, because they can get more points out of that person. It's bizarre. I must be missing something. I, I'm, that's what I'm. That's what I mean. That's why the first time I played it, it was like, no, I need to play this more because I'm obviously missing something, and it's no. Should, should we should we talk again about the marketing of this game? About- that's exactly what I wanted to go work into now. The just the general uh, displeasure of this game and how it was toted as a 4x game. What a blunder! And what I have written here is that we were told that it's a 4x game, and just because you repeat those words over and over in the rule book and over and over in the cards. Guess what? It does not make it so. Which is even... The the way that 4X... So, explore, expand, exploit, exterminate. Which usually refers to the bigger, heavier games like your Eclipse, like your Twilight Imperium. Or sometimes even to the slightly lighter games like the first Empires of the Void. Or some of the weird hybrids like Ascending Empires. But anyway. It conjures certain expectations. Which are manifestly not met in this game. There's no exploration. There's no real expansion. You expand your tableau, I guess. Yeah, no. You exploit your tableau, I guess. <laughs> but you don't exterminate anything, even when you're going and, and, and killing everybody else. It You kind of sort of research, but not really in a way that you do in a 4X game. You research in the way that you do in a tableau builder, which is to say you put another card in your tableau. You put another card in your tableau. That's all you do in this game, more or less. You put another card in your tableau. Fine. There are lots of great games that work that way. But the additional thing, above and beyond the fact that it it actively subverts, not in a good way, the expectations that people would have of a 4X game, those four words, explore, exploit, expand, exterminate, are not particularly good keywords to have on cards because they all sound too similar. There are a lot of scoring conditions that say you get plus one point for every explore card you have in your tableau. Well, it's harder. This is a minor point, but I, I, I find it increasingly frustrating when I play this game. It is increasingly difficult to scan through a tableau of 12 cards that all have a keyword, and all those keywords start with EX. I don't need that additional degree of user unfriendliness. You could have made the keywords anything. You just have four different kinds of cards. Are they vaguely thematically tied to the four Xs? Not really. So you could have just made it more clear. Instead, what you do is you generate expectations you don't meet and made it, make it more difficult to use. So congratulations. Well, what I want to move into is when this was presented by other people. Like, I don't know if you read any reviews or any, you know, this I don't know how to read. Out, but people who played this game beforehand, agree, you know, they toted this as a, as a good game, as a 4X game, as it lives up to these expectations. And I'm wondering if this is why there's such a negative lean towards this game right now. It's because it was toted as, as this game, as something good. And it is not. I don't. I'm not as. I'm not nearly as down on the game as you are. I don't really enjoy it. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna try to bring it to the table ever again. But I do. Th- I am surprised at the backlash that it is getting because I see lots of mediocre, low, low player interaction 
uh, tableau builders, like for example, terraforming Mars, getting praise to the skies. In many ways, some of the some some of the problems of alien artifacts, I think, are reminiscent of the problems of terraforming Mars. Terraforming Mars doesn't really have much substantive player interaction, and when it does, it's generally just bad for the system, like those pointless attack cards or just minor incidental blocking that just costs you, say, a point or minor opportunity cost. Past that, there's not much similarity, but you do end up just building this engine of cards, and you either get the cards you need or you don't, to a large extent. And I see lots of games that I think are desperately mediocre, getting very, very highly rated on Board Game Geek or elsewhere, and I don't necessarily find that mysterious, but when, given that Alien Artifacts at its core is a reasonably pleasant sort of mindless uh, affair of building up your tableaus and like, ooh, I built this nice-looking ship, or whatever... I was surprised at how much hate that it's getting, and I really do think it's because of how it was positioned as a 4X game, and people wanted a 4X game, they were told they were getting a 4X game, and then when they didn't, they rated it poorly, which I think is a reasonable response. I think that with uh, a slightly revamped combat system, and maybe even some notion of the resource cards being a scarce resource, maybe if you actually had income in terms of the the resource cards, that it wasn't just a guaranteed drawback up to your hand size at the end of every turn, so you're encouraged to waste them, and as, as a result, every build action either takes one or two turns, maybe sometimes three in rare extremists, uh, then maybe you might have something there, and maybe I'd, I'd like it a lot more. And that frictionless, when it's frictionless, it's perfectly pleasant, even if it's relatively shallow and not particularly interesting. And so the... There's a fair amount of the game that I enjoy doing, even though I don't yeah. think it's a pretty good game. It's just all those other elements are so very much out of place and serve to undercut the few pleasant elements that are there that I really can't recommend it as a design. Let's go over quickly. What what are you doing in Alien Artifact? Like I, I looked into this this morning. There's no flavor text at the beginning of this rule book. There's no explanation of why we're doing this. The only flavor text are on the faction cards, which briefly tell you about that faction, and on the alien artifact cards. There's a few, you know, ridiculous statements like, oh, that will make it more powerful, or that will, you know what I mean, that are completely arbitrary. Like, literally, there's no theme to this game whatsoever. Yeah. They have fantastic artwork that they could have utilized on, but other than that, there's like nothing. There's no in alien artifacts you you know were pushed out of your home country and now you're going into this new you know, there's nothing. Like why are we doing this? I well, don't understand. Well, I think it's because they recognize that they it's a reasonably straightforward card based tableau builder and you don't really need a whole lot of theme whole, or any theme a at whole all. Lot, or no theme at all. <laughs> like I can say not very much, but there's nothing. There's literally like even in some games like I was I was given a, a pre rule book for for castles and catapults and he didn't have a story at the beginning, so I sent him a message saying, you know you have to. At first he says, well we just didn't have room, and immediately you know just five minutes later he immediately sent another email back saying yeah you're to you know you're totally right there has to be something you know here's the draft of you know the story behind castles, you know you have to have an introduction to the game. There's not even that. That's a good point. I probably wouldn't have I probably wouldn't have appreciated the introduction but the lack of one is telling. Which is it's also worth noting it's a bit of a shame because um aside from uh some ambiguity with respect to the rules overall this is one of Portal's best rule books in ages. It's mostly comprehensible which and you know you're in trouble when that's high praise. So true. All right, I think we're done on Alien Artifacts. In Not, more ways than one, I think we're done with alien yeah, artifacts. In more ways than one, like I said, you said, you know, you hate it more than I do. I, I, it's not so much a hate or think it's a terrible thing. It's just the disappointment and the lost opportunity. I think is the most frustrating part. Well, you get you get very you sound upset whenever a game fails to provide a hook, as you say, which is a reasonable expectation. You're right. In a crowded market, it is reasonable to demand that a game offer something unique or some individual thing that you can point to to say, "I'm going to play this." as opposed to any of the dozen other type of games of its ilk. I don't... When, when that happens, I'm just more resigned, but you seem to get upset. There you go. Like I said, usually I'm the guy on the table. I thought this discussion of Alien Artifact were, was going to be you bashing it and me, like, trying to find somewhat good points in order to counter. But I said, no, I'm just not going to do it. I'm not going to... I'm going to put this under the bus. All right, so let's move on to our topic, and it's going to be what does Kickstarter bring to the table? So this is going to be a topic of... What has Kickstarter brought to the market so far? How has it benefited our community and games overall? 
All right, so let me start with uh, miniature quality and detail, you know, because they've upped the market. I think, you know, even games that come out not out of Kickstarter, they've had to change how they design their miniatures. And on that same point, it increases the jobs, right? Now there's more uh, sculptors being employed. There's more artists being employed because the same with, same with the artwork. The artwork has gone up incredibly due to Kickstarter. And I think even people that don't use Kickstarter, like I said, they have to up their game as well in order to keep, you know, keep the, 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 the level market. It is certainly the case that the market expectations with respect to the visual appeal of a board game have risen considerably. And you're absolutely right. Whether that actually has had any follow-on effects in terms of the market, I don't know. But it is certainly the case that you see far more artists of different art styles than you used to see back in the day. I remember back, you know, in the mid in the mid two thousands, the same artist would do half a dozen would have half a dozen Euro games out in the same year. And now it's the case that there there's just this explosion of different art. Overall, I agree with you. I think the visual impact of board games has increased, and I think it's reasonable to infer that that is because of the effect of Kickstarter. All right, now I got automatic expansions, Kickstarter exclusives, things you get in the in the Kickstarter itself that you wouldn't normally get in a normal retail edition. So you're going to get if the game, like say, not not every game appeals to everyone else. So if a game comes out in retail. It's something you really like, but unfortunately it didn't do well in the market. Even if there was expansions uh, in the works, that they would be just blown off because, you know, the game didn't sell well. In a lot of Kickstarters, when the Kickstarter does well, the expansions usually just flow right in and they're an add-on or it just comes in as part of the Kickstarter. And then even though, you know, you can, there are a lot of back and forth with these Kickstarter exclusives. Are they great? Are they not great? I look at them in the same way as I look with all the Star Wars movies. I'd rather have them than not have them. I'm a, yeah, it's a very, yeah, it's a very odd feeling. <laughs> you know, you, you you know that people get denied them. You're upset when you don't have them, right? But but I I don't feel as that it's a huge problem because they usually don't take away from the game. I've never seen a Kickstarter exclusive that makes the game less fun. Well, okay, here's the deal. Uh, we're going to try to limit this to the positive impacts of Kickstarter. If we want to rag on Kickstarter, we can do that some other time. And so with great difficulty, I'm going to focus on, on the positive. And I agree with you that having more variety and more stuff is often good. I just want to acknowledge that sometimes there's a downside to it. And I'll just mention two very, very briefly. One of them is sometimes the lack of editorial control. In the older model where you would release a base game and people would play the base game, everyone there was usually the expectation that a solid mass of people would know what the core experience was like before you started grafting on all this other stuff. But if you look at a lot of Kickstarters that become incredibly successful, very often you end up with a product with 27 modules at launch. And that can lead to subpar play experiences, either because people don't know what to do with them or because there's this, tempta this temptation. And this is on us. This is on us, the gamers. And I do the same thing all the time. The temptation to include things before people are ready to have a game expanded. And as far as it being better to have them than not have them, I'll agree with you in terms of add-on modules, but in terms of things that just get added to the base game, I know some people who swear, I don't have this problem myself, but I know some people who swear up and down that Kickstarter exclusive, um, whether they're you know monsters or characters or, or, or whatever, are automatically less well-balanced than those in the base game because there's this perception, and I think Eric Lang even has confirmed that this is the way he works, that he designs a base game, and when he starts looking for Kickstarter exclusives or Kickstarter add-ons, the first place he goes is the stuff that he cut during the development process because it wasn't clean or balanced enough. And so sometimes the stuff that should have been on the cutting room floor ends up in the finished product because of Kickstarter exclusives. I don't know if that's actually accurate. I don't know if that's the way that it is. But there's a perception amongst some that it can undermine the, the core game experience. And I know that that's sometimes the case. I will say, however... That sometimes that that one of the benefits of Kickstarter is you can get grotesque values for your money, insanely good deals. Like if you look at, 
I don't care what you think of Coolmany or not as a publisher. I don't care what you think about their designs. I don't care what you think about Kickstarter exclusives. I don't care what you think about expansions. But if you look at the return on a dollar that you get in just an average Coolmany or not Kickstarter project, it's ridiculous. It is ridiculous. The amount and quality of even just the physical material that you get from a base game pledge there, it's outrageous and unthinkable as as little as 10 years ago. Completely unthinkable. Uh, and it's not just it's not just cool many or not. If you look at uh, recently, the Mythic Battles Pantheon uh, pledges started shipping again. Far too late, but we're not we're not ragging on the Kickstarter no. now. Uh, Kingdom Death, Kingdom Death. You look at Gloomhaven. The amount of value that you got out of those first campaigns. You know, Kickstarter positions itself as a kind of an investment platform, and I think that's often false. But if you look at some of the returns on investment that people have gotten from unknown publishers or projects that were a little weird, and then raised hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars, and then shipped them tremendous quantities of stuff for pennies, you can't deny that there have been some outrageously good deals uh, to be had. And as a result, incredibly rewarding surprises and new voices in the industry. Isaac Childress will always now have clout. He's earned his influence. He designed the number one game on Board Game Geek, and it's a brilliant game. Uh, he, he, before, he was just some guy who had self-published a worker placement game. And now he's Isaac Childress. Uh, you know, the same thing is true of Adam Poots. Adam Poots was this guy who who hobby designed a small boutique range of, of miniatures. And now he's the guy, he's King of Death. And that's, a, that's like an industry unto itself. And uh, so, yeah, Kickstarter has definitely re- produced its promise in some instances as kind of almost being an investment platform where you get to collaborate with this artist and then this tremendous thing happens. So there's definitely still some magic left in in that platform, even for people who are skeptical of it like I am. Yeah, well, same thing with getting your money's worth. I've already talked about before when either Kickstarter or even sometimes it's even happened with retail uh, games where they put an expansion and it comes on Kickstarter, you can get the whole package deal. They, they'll even go back and give you those Kickstarter exclusives and the main game, like one big price will get you this new expansion plus the base game plus everything you got in the thing. I think that's a great deal. And to go quickly back to uh, too many add-ons, like I have this problem with uh, Zombicide Black Plague. There was so much when you you know bring the game out on the table, it's a little beast to set up because you don't know what you know what monsters are you going to add, how you what abomination to put in, and sometimes you say okay, it's not worth it. Let's just grab something else, right? So sometimes it can even you know stop you from getting it to the table. Stay positive, Walker. Stay I will positive. stay positive. No, there are, I have negatives at the end. I do want to go into negatives, but let's just go over. Let's finish on. Well, can, let's can, finish on can, that. Let's go to. No, no. Can I go back to something? Yes, you said for before? sure. The, you were talking about being able to get the base game and everything else that was released. Kickstarter has been a great way for some products to return to print because you get to gauge interest with no upfront financial commitment. And, you know, at its at its worst, this is for companies to use it basically as an online storefront. At its best, it's a way for people to discover, hey, people do want another edition of Upfront, for example. And even though the Kickstarter failed and it turned out to be a scam... Part of that, realizing that there was money there, part of that spurred Wargame Vault to go and get the rights and, and be able to return it to print. And so you see these long out-of-print games come back in part because you don't have to take the risk. It offloads all the risk, and again, there are negatives to that, but it offloads the risk, and so you get to do riskier things like returning old things to print, like putting out weird designs. Uh, and that leads to more diversity in the market, which I think is definitely for the good. All right, let's just talk about projects in general. And what I have here is when you pledge on a Kickstarter, you know, you're getting notifications about all these pledge levels getting hit. You're watching, you know, the product being developed. You're watching add-ons being made. You're watching, you got a shipping notice and you're waiting for this game to come and you get this game that you, you know, the sting of the payment has, you know, been made long ago. So now it's like almost getting, you know, this free game. So it's just this over this overwhelming, the not overwhelming, just this overall feeling of what a Kickstarter project is, right? It's this constant interaction, these notifications you're getting, you know, constantly, you know, interaction with the designer and, you know, stuff like that. It's, uh, you know, I mean, it just leads into why it's so successful, I think. I'm, bu- I'm in the process of buying a house. And as a result, I've got no money at all, period. And, well, no money to spend. 
And uh, so when Empires of the Void 2 came a couple days ago, it's like, great, I paid for this a year ago. <laughs> and it was, I still get to get new games because it's on this long delay. So you're right, there, there, there's an upside to that. The engagement with the creator is also something that a lot of people really value. I'm, uh, I really like designer notes. I really like it when a, when a published game has a page or two at the back of the rulebook for, uh, you know, the, a little editorial on the game designer talking about their inspiration and how they came to, to do what they're doing or historical context if it's a historical game or, or what have you. And when creators in Kickstarter updates or things like that give me that, I'm a big fan. When it's endless rigmarole about, well, we received the master production copy today or I was in talks with a factory in China, whatever. I don't find production updates to be particularly compelling or gripping or talking about proofs or, or, or what have you. So some of it's good, some of it I can ignore. But yes, you can't deny that that engagement with creators when it happens can be very, very special. All right, let's hit negatives. I'm going to go with one here. The fact that some companies use this to bypass the middleman. So the typical situation is a publisher makes a game. They sell it to a distributor. The distributor sells it to your local game store. So then you've got multiple people there making money. How Kickstarter works is 100% of the money is either going to A, the distributor, or B, just the designer. So you're cutting out all of these middlemen. Well, you but you have different middlemen, right? Amazon Payments is getting its cut. Kickstarter is getting its cut, right? The the shipping company... But all of that is out of industry, right? Normally, it would be within our industry, right? I would be helping out everyone. It would be helping the hobby as a whole. I'm not saying this is good or bad. And I'm not saying this particular are you, thing... Are you, are you sticking up for Alliance Distributing? Not, are you really... Not at all. No, it's not Alliance. If anyone would be... Uh, Lion Rampant would be someone I would care... That's, a, you know, someone you know local here in Toronto. Sure, sure. But I don't know. I mean, at the end of the day... I don't necessarily object to wholesaling. Like, cause no, you're I'm basically, not, I'm you're basically not, objecting I'm, to wholesaling. I'm not objecting. I'm, this is a point that people are making. <laughs> I'm proposing this as, you sound as, like, you sound like a certain American president at this point. It's like, I'm not saying this is just what I heard. <laughs> this is what I heard. Yeah. It's not, it's not actually, no, no. These, these are all things that we can choose. Either we can choose to, to do it or not do it. So I, I have no negatives or positives. Well, it, if, it, if you don't like it as a person, then you don't, then you don't, you wait for it to come to retail. So I, any, I will say this. It cuts out. I don't necessarily have a dog in, I don't necessarily have a dog in the fight of your friendly local game store versus your online game store. There's a lot going on there in terms of both economics and and culture and a whole bunch of other stuff. And I'm not I'm definitely not going to plant my flag here, but I will say this: I have heard complaints from owners of local game stores that for all the competition they get online, the thing that often sinks them is that if there is a product with a a boatload of Kickstarter exclusives, they find it very difficult to move it retail. I don't know if that's true. Here I'm going to be pulling a Walker or a Trump and saying this is just what I've heard. This gotcha. is what people have said. And I'm certainly sympathetic to the notion that cutting out all game stores entirely, which is what Kickstarter often does, could have detrimental impacts later on. All right, let's take it one step further. These pl- these uh, Kickstarter projects, using it as like an online store platform where... If this is their second or third game, they're offering their old games on the Kickstarter as well, or offering other games, or even main like cool mini or I'm not you know cool mini or not they just had they had they sort of pushed this Kickstarter ahead. That's what pushed their company. So I, I'm living. I'm willing to give them a pass. I shouldn't say a pass because it's you know sounding like it's a negative thing, but but uh, companies that have already solidified themselves in the retail market like Queen Games or Mayfair falling back onto Kickstarter using it as like this risk fee, risk free way to put out games. Yeah, I'm of two minds about that as well. On the one hand, I really admire when uh, Jamie Stegmeyer of Stonemeyer Games said, "Look, we've made it. We're a we're a we're a grown up big boy company now, so we're not going to use Kickstarter anymore." He said that after Scythe took off. Scythe, he said, was going to be their last Kickstarter project of that type. I think he left the door open for possibly something else. So Charterstone was not released through Kickstarter, even though he could have, and he probably would have been able to secure funding. Um, so I, I, I respect people who desire to, quote-unquote, keep Kickstarter pure. I don't necessarily resent major companies who use Kickstarter as a funding platform. I, I, I think a lot of the opposition to that comes from 
a sort of exaggerated sense of the purity of Kickstarter as a way for independent artists to blah, blah, blah. That may or may not be true, but I'm, I'm relatively agnostic as to distribution methods and, and so forth. If there's, if that is the way it makes sense for you to get to your client, then more power to you and you might as well. And if you as a client perceive that you're going to be able to get good value out of this sales method or something else, you know, absent deception, I'm broadly in favor of people being able to buy whatever they want, however they want to. Uh, I will say this, though, in terms of the effect that it's had on the kind of products that people are offering, uh, I think the important corollary to that observation we made about how games look better and have better stuff is in part because Kickstarter is a visual medium, right? You don't... In, in, in the old days, when you made a pitch to a publisher, my understanding is, and I've, I've spoken to some publishers about this, it was very often about, well, here's what the design is, and here, here you can situate it in the market, etc. Because it was expected that the art assets would come later, and or that it would be provided by the publisher. But now, everyone's their own pitch man because of Kickstarter. Everything has to lead with the art. And so you end up with a lot of games that are visually stunning and completely bankrupt. And these often do very, very well on Kickstarter because if it's a if it's great looking in a shitty game, it's going to profit. It's it, it, it's probably going to going to thrive in an environment where that's everything that, that people can it can see. I definitely think it's the case that you know the number of times when I've I've browsed through a Kickstarter project that looked really, really nice and visually attractive, only to read the rules to see that there was nothing new or interesting there. And even you know even though it had already garnered half a million bucks. Uh, that's happening more and more and more and more now. And I don't know if this is going to have a bad effect on, on the market overall, but it has certainly soured my interest in checking out the new and latest thing on Kickstarter for certain. With the increased demand on good art and better quality managers, are there some smaller designers and publishers being left behind? I'm really not sure. It's it's weird because one of the, the benefits of Kickstarter is you've seen the rise of the solo publisher, right? A one-person more or less one person operation who designs and publishes their own game like like Isaac Childress and Cephalofair games like Kingdom Death like Ryan Laucat and Red Raven and so forth and it's worth noting that all three of those companies have now produced games with miniatures and it's an expensive time consuming complicated process you know making your first design with miniatures but more and more companies seem to be able to do that now in part that's because Ryan Laucat himself is an artist, and so he's always been able to present how visually appealing his games are. And Kingdom Death was always a miniatures... It was a miniatures line before it was a miniatures game, so that, that made things easier. I'm not really sure about the details about how and when Isaac Childress, you know, got in touch with the artists that he got in touch with and be able to uh, uh, present the, the, the world of Gloomhaven that he did. But I don't necessarily know that it's squeezing out the independent operators. What, what I think it might be squeezing out is the old mid-range publishers. Well, that's what I mean, like game published like cheap ass games, right? Mm. Who brought out, you know, these, you know, black and white books, you know, people were interested in them because that's all that was there at the time. Now people's expectations have been brought up to, you know, these Kickstarter levels. That's what I'm wondering if now these people like kick like cheap ass games or smaller publishers that just want to put out their smaller games, whether they're just being overlooked now because they don't live up to these standards. Yeah, it's definitely the case that your art assets need to be finalized before your design assets are finalized, and that's an unfortunate fact of the way Kickstarter works. It's this is actually another corollary, uh, a, a, a sort of downside of the the upside that you talked about. This creator engagement with the fans, I think can lead to bad results. Let, let, me, let me put all my cards on the table here. I'm, I'm an unapologetic elitist, uh, like many good Canadians. I believe in gatekeepers. I believe in editorial control. I believe in development work. And good developers are worth their weight in gold. And I've seen some of the very best at, at work. You know, working with really creative people, but really serving to refine uh, and polish a good game idea. And we don't seem to have demand for developers anymore because we have the wisdom of the crowd. And it's the wisdom of the crowd that gave us things like the Massive Darkness campaign mode because people demanded it and it's terrible. And a lot of people then have, like I said, that initial bad reaction to a game because there's less and less editorial control over what's going on. There's this desire in many cases to respond to every errant backer's you know, a backer who thinks that they're an investor or a partner in this project instead of just a purchaser of a product. And sometimes that leads to deleterious influence on designs. 
they're you know, the good old days, there used to be gatekeepers. There were people whose job it was. And there, of course, there are downsides to this. I'm not lionizing, uh, you know, gatekeepers. Open sourcing is good, but it also leads to some unfortunate results. And I think some of these things that we're talking about can be directly traced to greater customer engagement with the creator. There's this view that you're not responsible anymore to producing a good product. You're responsible for meeting the specific expectations of a howling group of monkeys on kicks on a Kickstarter comment thread. And to a certain extent, that's always going to be the challenge of creators, you know, feeling the, the, the needs to accommodate their customer. But I'm dubious of breaking down all those barriers because they do lead to some good results, but also some bad results. Yeah. It falls into the same thing as, you know, I don't want to go into politics or anything, but you know, the, the vocal 1%, you know, are the ones that are, are molding the society. Internet comments, whether it's for a Kickstarter project or anything, is always going to be driven by that vocal one percent, and it's it's tough to to to, to really get things. And in and I just wish there was more room for for developers and for the elite. Not me, I'm not talking about me, but for the elites, the developers, the people who've been in the business for a while, the people who are whose job it is uh, who to take an unpolished design and polish it. Instead, what we have very often are the people who either are good artists themselves or who have a good artist, who have all these great art assets. The art assets drive the Kickstarter project, and then it's only after the Kickstarter project is done that you actually start to bother finishing the game, or you only bother doing playtesting while the factory in China is shut down for Chinese New Year, and you're responding to all these specific comments on threads, and you don't know if these are representative of the community, you just know that there are some loud people on the internet, and... I don't know if that's just my elitism talking or if it's actually having a deleterious effect on some of these products. All right. Well, that's pretty well all I have. Well, those are our thoughts on the topic for now. I think this is the kind of thing that we can return to maybe in a year's time and, and reflect a- again on how the hobby seems to be shifting as a result of these influences. That has been your episode of So Very Wrong About Games. If you want to reach one of us, my co-host, Mike Walker, can be reached at justrolledadice at gmail.com. That's J-O-S-T-R-O-L-L-D-A-D-I-C-E at gmail.com. You can find me, Mark Bigney, on Twitter at all the games you like. Find us collectively as So Very Wrong About Games on Facebook. That is where we keep most of our uh, conversation going. We still have not had people successfully identify, by the way, all the dice in our banner image. So if you think you can identify the couple of missing games that are represented there, please do send in your guesses. If you win, I can guarantee you a perfectly void check worth, let's say, a million dollars. Oh, yeah. Totally. A great price. Great price. Maybe even a shout out on your least favorite board game podcast. We could probably manage that. Yeah. Yeah. I doubt it. But you know, we can we can promise it. There's no stopping that. <laughs> oh yeah, our promises are cheap. We could promise all manner of things. And like like I if if you enjoyed this podcast, just tell one other person. That would be great. But make it a cool person. Yeah. We I mean we don't want we don't we want, want s- posers. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us. We hope to see you again very soon on So Very Wrong About Games. Take care. Later. You've been listening to So Very Wrong About Games, produced by Michael Walker and edited by Mark Bigney. Special thanks goes to What Does It Eat for generously allowing us to use their most excellent song, FOS, as our theme. You can find them at whatdoesiteat.com. You can reach us by email at soverywrongaboutgames at gmail.com or on Twitter at sowronggames. Thanks very much. See you next time. And always, try to be right. But remember, you are so very wrong. Uh, now I'm starting to sound like a uh, very, very self-satisfied wanker. But uh, what else is new? No, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think you totally First time ever. Write it down. You're, you're misreading that. Yeah, I just marked the calendar. Thanks. Yeah, mark the calendar. First time ever.